So I would like to start because we have a lot of things to cover. OK, so um, preview, uh, uh, hi, hi, hi to you all, uh, and welcome to the world of clean code. Um, who am I, first of all? Um, well, what, what we'll do? Uh, a, a bit of motivation, what do we need clean code? Then the power that it invested in your fingertips when you select good names. Then some words about the single responsibility principle. Then something about the OOP utopia. Then some words about incompetence and some closing thoughts about how to handle a lightsaber in your enterprise application development. Good. So who am I? I'm a tech lead. I'm a consultant, one of the lead architects for the largest client of IBM Romania. But if I were to define myself in terms of what I think I'm doing, at, at what I, I want to do, I wouldn't define myself as a clean code evangelist, if not clean code maniac. Uh, I'm really passionate about this topic, and I kept talking about these topics like clean code, clean architectures, and clean lambdas in all sorts of conferences. In my spare time, however, I love to train. So I'm mostly a trainer uh, on various topics like Spring, Java EE, clean code, design patterns, test-driven development, performance, and many more. OK, but enough about me. What's clean code? Clean code does one thing well, says the inventor of C++. I mean, you can already see the single responsibility principle right in there, right? Clean code reads like well-written prose. It's like the, the man who wrote the code did his best effort to write good code, readable code. Clean code looks like it was written by someone who cared, who put his soul, his best, his best effort, his best energy into writing good code. Clean code is when each method you read turns out to be pretty much what you've already expected from the context of that method. So the code should not surprise you. Anyone can write code that a computer can understand, but very few programmers are able to write code that humans can understand. That's the principle here. We no longer code, we should communicate. Now, before you can move on, we should define what is the international unit of measuring for code, for, for, for clean code. How do you measure clean code? When is code clean? Well, probably you know that that's the international unit of measuring for, for clean code, is how often the code annoys you when you review it, when you inspect it, when you read it, right? So this is actually um, an application of the principle of least astonishment. The code should not shock you, should not make you wonder, should not surprise you. should be pretty much what you've already expected out of it. Why do you need clean code? It's pretty simple, that because most of you probably know that the true cost of software is in its maintenance. 80% of the cost is, is paid after the initial release of the project. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, to write it bet, best as possible from the beginning. Now, that, um, that this happens because as, we, as, we, as time passes by, we become slower and slower because the code degrades. No one cares about the code, and code gets dirtier and dirtier. You may not be concerned of these financial considerations, but the thing that you end up reading code 10 times more than you write code should care. I mean, should, should matter, because uh, if you think that if the code that you wrote in 10 minutes will be read two hours, it kind of makes sense to do your best to write good code. One simple rule that you can do in this sense, right from Monday morning, is the Boy Scout rule. This goes the following. Whenever you check out code from Git to do some change requests, some feature adding, whatever, Besides implementing the thing that you wanted to do, spend some more time doing some random acts of kindness, some minor refactorings, renamings, extract methods, pretty simple stuff that you can do, safe stuff, easy stuff that will keep the code alive. Otherwise, you will come, otherwise you will come to job in such a place, right? Dominated by fear. Because fear usually equals legacy. In a legacy project, fear dominates the project. And you can even put it in the calendar. The day in which you stopped refactoring, it is the day in which your application has become legacy, right? And you can drink to that, right? Okay, today I, I, I feared to refactor. Today my application has become legacy. Because tomorrow you will be more afraid. In one month you will be more afraid. You will never refactor if you, if you don't right now. Okay, now. You know, they, they say, with great power comes great responsibility. There it was on the slide in the previous talk. The point is, uh, many of us are drawn to programming by this act of pure creation. You literally invent things in your head. You put them in code, you run them, and they actually do stuff. 
It's amazing. You get to build stuff out of your head. And you have to select good names for these things, right? Because it's a great responsibility to, to name all of these components that you invented out of nothing. In this, purpose, in this sense, verb uh, methods should always include a kind of verb. What does the function named product do? Come on. What does it do? It, right? Search product, do something. For booleans, it's pretty simple. The names should, to should tell that there's something true or false there. You can't possibly answer with green to such a question, right? It's true or false. Just by reading the very name, you are sure that that's a boolean there inside. Now, with, with classes, we, okay, they are nouns, basic stuff, but the point is, when you select names for these classes, make sure not to include such useless particles like info or data. Tell me, just by looking at the names of the classes, how, what's the difference between order info and order? Right? It doesn't say anything. Perhaps you should have said order details and brief order or something to express that is just a part of the order. Either way, this is a way, this is basically you are not using the power that you are given. You are, you are refusing to put good names, right? Um, in the same spirit, whenever you encounter something which is called iCustomer Service, what is it? Tell me. It, it, it's an interface, right? And it has one implementation, let me guess. The, class impl the implementing class is named Customer Service, right? So it's just useless. It's, this is misunderstood polymorphism. And the same applies to that example. So my point to you is delete your interfaces. Simple as that. Delete your interfaces. There are only three excuses to use interfaces. When you, do, when you package them in jars and you give them to your clients for them to, to, do, to do remote invocations from Java, whenever you want to do strategy pattern and you literally have multiple various implementations of that interface that you pick at runtime, or perhaps you want to implement the interface in a lower level module, in which case you are doing the dependency inversion principle. But that's another story about the onion and so on. Now, a more simple example. How do you understand the function? You run over a function that you need to invoke in some way. How do you understand it? One way would be to read the comment, right? Another way would be to look uh, at the place where this function is being invoked and invoke it just the same, just in a similar way. Another approach will be to actually open the implementation and read line by line whatever the function was doing. You shouldn't need to do either of these. It's useless effort. The name should tell everything that that function was doing. The very name should tell the intention of that function. But, you know, sometimes you, you walk through legacy code and you think you found a better name for a certain class or function or whatever. The point here is this thought occurs to you. Oh, my God, I couldn't possibly have found a better name that was put there by the predecessors, by the elders, right, who wrote that application 10 years ago. This is complete nonsense because you learn as you implement the application, you get better names. So take advantage of this, of this feeling that you have and refactor it. It takes seconds with IDE and rarely, rarely fails. It is absolutely normal that by this time, I'm almost sure that most of you have figured out that we are not being paid for writing code. We are being paid for understanding what the business wants and fulfilling their needs. The code doesn't actually matter. What matters is that we should understand, we should learn the world of the business and, and may provide them with a good solution. This actually has a name when you refactor some code after you've, you've deciphered it. It's called re comprehension refactoring, just to leave uh, behind you a, a better explained code, actually. Now, rename it. Continuously rename it as you learn the application, because there are no perfect names. You all know this, this quote, right? There are only two things hard in programming, right? Cache invalidation, distributed cache, cache trash, la 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 la, and naming things. So finding good names is really, really hard. Your team will be grateful. Yourself will be grateful. Tell me one thing. How many of you have sworn, have spoken bad words about some code, and then found out that they were the author of that code? So 
the point is, right, probably you didn't review the code enough back then, but more importantly, you forget the decisions you made in the design. You forget the code. After, after a weekend, after two weeks, you no longer are aware of all the details of your implementation. So my point to you is leave the code behind you as clean, as well described, explained as possible, because you will come back to that code, and you won't remember anything. Now, continuous renaming just like distillery, right? Names should be for at least pronounceable, so please avoid any kind of abbreviations. We use words, we are writing literature, remember? We are writing prose here, we are not coding anymore. So don't, don't add new abbreviations, but don't be smart and write in your code value-added text. Come on, use VAT, of course. It's something from the business. If some, if some abbreviation is already a classic abbreviation in the world of the business, you should use it in your code. But try to avoid, to postpone as much as possible adding new abbreviations to your code that have to be learned and so on. Names should be consistent. How do you go to database? With find something, get something, fetch, load? Well, what verb do you use? Whatever verb you use, make sure, all, make sure you establish some naming conventions. In my projects, for example, find will give me a null if nothing's there, where get will throw me, throw me an exception. Whatever convention you use, make sure everyone knows this convention and applies it. In the same spirit, don't refer to a buyer and client and customer to the same concept because the, because the reader will be puzzled. Why is this a buyer there? This is a, here is a client and there is a customer. What's the difference? There is no difference actually. The writer was just being overly creative. You want to be creative, write poetry, write, write something, start painting, but don't be overly creative in your code. Your code should be as concise, uh, should leave no room for doubts. Now, do you know this gap, right, between business and IT? Business is there with the money, and we are there with the bytes, with the binary file. We need to give them the binary in exchange for the money. So for a minimum thing, we need to establish a common language between us. So learn from their world and explain to them the limitations of our IT systems. Okay, now, about the single responsibility principle. A function should do one thing, should do it well, should do it only, says Uncle Bob. For this purpose, a function should be small. How small? How small should a function be? How many lines of code? 15. One script? <laughs> One screen, exactly, one screen. But the Bible, uh, I mean, the uh, clean code book says five lines. Now, five lines, I know it's absurd. Oh my God, five lines. I've seen methods of 1,000 lines. I've refactored those. I know how it feels. But five lines, why so few? Just play with me. How many things can you do in five lines? You do a try catch, and you are left with two lines, right? What would you do in those two other lines? You will, you will need to call other functions, of course, right? So you'll just call, call, call other functions. The point is, if you have functions of only five lines, you have a better chance to find a good name that tell what you just did in five lines of code. Come on, I think you, you can do it. So you have a better chance of finding a good name for that. Good, now indeed, in our enterprise applications, I agree we have this monkey work from time to time, so this boilerplate code, get set, get set. You know, that code, uh, ugly code, brainless code. This kind of code doesn't, doesn't worth factoring in five lines of code. So this code can be larger, up to one IDE screen, but I don't mean you should, you should rotate your monitor when I say that. So keep the, f the function. My heuristic is another one. If I, can, if I open a function, I see it for the first time, and I cannot understand what it does in three seconds, I split it. So the simple methods, trivial methods, can be larger. But those which contain the, the creepy business logic of your application, those should be five lines long, eight lines long, in that spectrum. Cool. Now, if you don't, you end up with such, a, with such a function, okay? Like I did some years ago, right? And I was very proud of this function. I loved this function. I knew all its shapes. I oriented via the indentations. I knew the if, the for. I knew everything about it. I dreamt about that. The point is, for me, for the author, for the sculptor, 
it was very clear about the, it, its shapes, but for the entire team, they were like lost in this function. It was like wilderness, you know? If I gave you this function and tell you to do a change request, what would you do? You probably would start with the first line because you are a, you are a warrior, right? And you start reading, 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 reading. At some point, what's that? Lunch break. You know, the, the pyramid of need. We need to eat. Let's go eat. Then you return. You were somewhere, somewhere here. What do you do? You don't recall exactly what was there above, but you keep reading, reading, reading. And at some point, you found it. Yes, in that place, I need to do this other stuff. What do you do next? What, what? Uh, uh, I, I put an if. <laughs> the if there. What, what does this mean? You have found a pile of garbage and you have a tissue in, in your hand. What do you do? You know? I mean, uh, the, yeah, <laughs> exactly. The point, is, the point is, you just added one more responsibility to the same garbage bin. What you should have done instead is to grab the axe and chop it into small pieces, into small methods, and then combine those methods as you wish for the new use case. Wow, so extracting methods out of such a function, how many methods do you think I ended up with? Huh? Hmm? 25, 20, 25, around that number. Now imagine, uh, let me ask you one thing. Why was I scared? Why was I terrified? I had 25 functions, and please don't mention performance. With performance, it, no, small functions run faster because the most used path through that method gets hot faster and gets compiled to native code faster. So it actually runs faster in, in the, using the JIT. With performance, all that matters is measuring stuff. Measure, don't guess. Don't ever think you know how GVM works until you've read a couple of books about that. So measure, don't guess. Always measure. This guy who dedicated his entire life optimizing algorithms said premature optimization is the root of all evil. Don't optimize upfront your algorithms. Don't use string builder. Don't do stuff, useless stuff, just to optimize the thing. See the problem. It takes 15 minutes. Optimize. It takes 14 minutes. It doesn't worth it. Optimize it in another way. It takes three seconds. Okay. Leave the optimization in place. So do stuff whenever you measure the problem, not up front. So no, not performance. But what other thing do you think scares me? Let, let me take, let, let me say that. So I had this wonderful function that I knew I, I dreamt about that. But now I have 25 functions. Christ, I don't even recall the name of, that, of those functions when I finished naming them, right? So 25, no one can, 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 can remember 25 names. It, it's impossible. So for you, for the author, it's harder to reason about the code. But for the entire team, it's a lot easier. Why? Because they will work with methods like remove all past canceled orders of consumer. With all due respect, if you don't understand what this, this function does, I don't want to work with you. So brain-dead simple methods that scream to the reader what they, what they are doing. That's how the code should look. Now, let's talk about single responsibility principle. How many things do you think this function could do, possibly? Well, let's play. True, 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 false, 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 false. Right? So there are four possible combinations, right? But usually, it, it, it results in three methods when you split them. This is a clear sign, not of laziness, but usually of fear or rush, right? Strict deadlines. And it's a, now the point is, it's, a, it's an important point here. Whenever you see a method with Boolean parameters, it tells you two things. First, developers fear that function, are terrified by that function. And secondly, most importantly, that this function changed recently. So it is the perfect candidate to start refactor with because it's, it's, it's a live code that changes, but it's the, the developers fear the code. So it's a, it's a good place to start refactoring with these kind of methods. Now, if the customer was, can be null, what would you do inside the method? You will test for null, right? Okay, so there are two things there, you see? 
So I would say, don't accept nullable parameters. Oh my God, oh my God, what am I saying? Don't accept null parameters. Then when do I check the invalid data? When do I check the, the, uh, the four gigabytes profile photo? The, six, the 600 character long name? Or the negative age? Where do I check those? Well, it's time to talk about null words. Null words, or where do I fight with invalid data? Suppose you could build a wall inside your application, and you could put some code inside the fortress in a place with peace and happiness and zen, you know? Uh, I would prefer to put inside this fortress my business logic code, that functional complexity that makes my application unique, that thing that is very creepy to understand, very hard to grasp, that kind of code I want to put inside. Outside the walls, I will keep the enemy. And the first enemy of the state is the user, of course, right? Along with all the other sources of invalid data, right? Queues, web services, files, blah, blah. All the invalid data should, should go through this gate where I put a strong bodyguard. And I thoroughly defense against any kind of invalid data. Check the data. Totally. I mean, every, every field, every field. Don't allow anything to enter the fortress unless it is perfectly valid. By doing this, you can gain a sense of trust. You can gain a sense of confidence inside the business logic. The business logic is complicated as it is. You don't want to, to dirty it with null checks and the length of strings and so on. So keep these validations at the entry points in your system. Now, at some time, there is, can be some uh, null, some invalid data appearing inside the fortress, but this null can have a business meaning, can be, the, for example, a customer without a gold card. The best thing you can do in such scenarios is to wrap it in the optional, which is the best, the best underused feature of Java 8. So wrap it in an optional and move the optional through your application. It's super, super cool. Now, in case the null is an invalid condition, is a fatal condition, don't be ashamed to throw an exception when you spot any kind of inconsistency, any kind of problem. Throw it away. And this is how we get to exceptions. You know that war that once was between runtime and checked exception? Should we use a checked exception or should we use runtime exceptions? Well, the war has, always, has long ended. And the clear winner is the runtime exception. In your domain application, in your, in your business, in your enterprise applications, you should use only runtime. Why? Because we don't see them. We, we aren't tempted to swallow exceptions. We aren't, we don't, aren't forced to try, catch, to throw. Come on, we don't see them. Now, just, just some of my preferences, I always make sure I put some global exception handler at every thread entry point, from HTTP, from GMS, for, from scheduling, from thread executors, and so on. So I'm, I'm sure to have this log, this catch-all safety net in place. Then. In case I want some, uh, some intelligent message for the user, I put an enum inside the exception, which I translate at the boundary to a nice message. Le serveur est prof. Uh, something like that, right? Then, um, if I do that, the only uh, possible, uh, the only use cases for having still catches in my block are recoverable conditions. We do OOP. Whenever you, we create some library, some API that is intended for reuse, whenever you create mycorp-common-1.0, and that's the problem with libraries, this 1.0, because tomorrow I will find a bug, and I will want my clients to migrate to 1.1. If when they migrate, their, their, their code crashes in pain, they won't migrate, and my bug will go to production. So when you're never, you create a framework or library, your purpose should be backwards compatibility to ensure smooth transition of your existing clients. That's when we need a OP. OK, now about failures. But first of all, can you spot the sunglasses in this code? Let me help you. Sunglasses, we are looking for sunglasses. Oh, there they are. Ah, yeah. But this is not matrix, you know. It's about teamwork. There is, you are not Neo. It's all about teamwork. We don't code in our caves anymore. We communicate. We are working in teams. Whoa. So, remember this one. Your code will be read 10 times more. You, it took you 10 minutes to write some, some code. It will be read almost 
two hours by someone and you don't want to know the thoughts that this, that guy will have about you. So make sure your code is as expressive as possible. Write literature. Never obfuscate. Never. There is no excuse to obfuscate stuff. Never. Don't use creepy lambdas or two-page long lambda. Don't do that. Right? Now, if you have energy, write a clean, dry, fast, non-overlapping, significant unit test. It's the most difficult challenge for any developer, however senior it is. Now, your IDE must be tuned. You should learn those shortcuts. You should do contests, refactoring exercises without the mouse. And learn those shortcuts. Uh, tune, uh, configure nice imports, nice default code blocks. Make sure you deploy on your local dev in a matter of seconds. Shorten that, that feedback loop. I wouldn't say test-driven development, but test-driven development. Do stuff to shorten the feedback loop that you have. A line should never exceed 120 characters because there are of us still that code in the airplane, you know, that position, the, the newborn position in the, in the airplane, right? And you don't want to hunt for the scroll bar, right? Just let's hunt the horizontal scroll bar. Click, oh yes, drag, yeah! Don't, don't do that. Functions, short functions, but files in themselves less than 200 lines, never for more than 500. There is no excuse. Now, if we use tabs or characters, the Egyptian style or not, how do you format code, doesn't matter. All that matters is that you all follow the same formatting rules. And my favorite slide. Comments are a written, um, a written proof of your incompetence. It is a statement that I was not able to express myself in code. Therefore, my consciousness screams to me, say something there, leave something there, and what do I do? I put a comment. Stop, stop, when you are, whenever you are tempted to put a comment in your implementation. Walk a bit, return, and see whether if, if you can express it in code. Why do I hate comment? Is that they lie to us. They lie to us in the face. Because statistically, 15 to 25% of good developers always change the, job, the, the, the comments when they modify the code, the implementation. So the comments will end up lying to us. Even the IDE creators knew that. So they configured that default color for comments to be grayed out, right? Washed away, not to disturb our eyes, you know? Just because they, they all know the only source of truth, it's not the documentation, not the specification, it is the live code which runs in production. Now, quick example. How do you, um, let's read this code, right? Int array x in the list, if x of 0 equals 4, and my brain just died. 4, come on, really? 4? So the first thing you should do is to explain those uh, weird constants there. Then you could introduce useless variables, which exist only for a couple of, of lines, such as this, you know, is flagged equals is flagged. This variable is almost useless, only exists there to put a name to that computation, right? And this is the way you can break those multi-line boolean tests, you know, that feeling, if, and then starts, la 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 la, and, enter. La, 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 or, la, 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 and lots of parentheses, right? What do I do about the, those? I select each individual block, I extract them as variables above the if, and then I just compose all the variables in one single line. It's a lot easier. Prepare the reader for what comes. Right? Then you can even go further and create useless methods. I mean, sh very short methods, like is flagged, which only contain this bool and test there. They are silly if you look at them, but are there just to put names to the computation. This is called actually encapsulated conditionals, and it's super useful whenever you use filter from Java 8. We will see in a moment. This, together with splitting your methods into smaller chunks, are the way you want to document your code with live documentation, with running code. The running code will tell the story. Bad comments. Mumbling, this is my favorite. First of all, when you read such a comment, how do you feel? Bad. Right? The negative uh, emotions of the author are conveyed to you. You never should do that. This guy probably needed professional assistance, but the point here is that I'm afraid about the possibility that this might have been a to-do instead. You know, that's what terrifies me. I'm not sure if it's a to-do or not. So for a minimum, praise to-do if you want to be a to-do. Redundant, that's, this, is the, this is matrix. This is the, the victory of machines above humans, you know? Uh, sonar defeated us. 
this is a clear sign of a long, huge class which should be splitted. Commented out code is not to be read, not to be understood. No, just deleted on spot. We have Git for that. And whenever you need to put a comment, put it on that line, not on the class or on the method, on that line. And if you really have energy, don't try to describe me what abstract factory design pattern is. Just put a link to the Wikipedia if you really want, but don't explain to me with enthusiasm. The enthusiasm is good, but use it to do katas, to learn, to engage your open source, to do something intelligent, not commenting, right? Good comments. Whenever you just can say that you want to use Jigsaw algorithm or we do some creepy stuff to work around the bug, put a new URL about it, that thing. Clarifications. If you really have to pass minus one as the first parameter to a certain function, it's, you want to explain to your reader that API. If you are not sure who will maintain your code, you, you could tell that. You know, don't ever put simple data format on a field, for Christ's sake. To do's, sharp followed by the name of the author. Public Java docs, that's important. If you write a framework, a mini library, something reusable, do as much documentation as possible in order to keep the developers, the client developers, at the API level to avoid them having to dig in your implementation. For example, look at the Java doc of Spring. Right? Huge amount of documentation just to keep the, 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 the users out of their implementation classes. Legal stuff and so on. OK, then how do we handle the lightsaber? Why do we love Java 8? Because it's cool, right? It literally caused a, an increase in the popularity of Java, really. Right? This is where Lambda were added. So they are cool, indeed. And they are expressive. But my question is, are they cleaner than Java 7? Actually, you can write expressive code, but you can, even write, you can also write cryptic code like that. You know, I mean, so opening a stream in another stream, come on. For that purpose, I even organized a little study of my own, some form that you can fill to give your opinion about how readable do you think some, some snippets are. So first thing, a lambda should never break line. You aren't allowed to write lambdas on multiple lines. Then don't chain too much. Don't write 10 filter, 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 and 10 uh, chaining methods. It, 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 your brain dies because you won't know, for example, map, 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 flat map, filter, group by flat. Don't do that because you won't know at each point what is the item type of your stream. You get lost at some point if there are so many uh, chainings. Then predicates you will see in a moment, and master any map and master flat map. So let's take this example. Hmm. How do you organize? I know, I'm using Eclipse. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm using Eclipse. Who? I don't know. I, know. I, I tried. But, uh. Now, it's a filter here, but in my filter, I see I'm using two conditions. So if I'm joining them with end, I can simply do. I want to cover all the things that there are about clean lambdas, but just so, so for you to have an idea. Then I'm looking at this one. Can you figure out a better way of implementing this? To create a helper method inside the entity, right? I mean, let's go here and say is not in stock, for example. And create this. Oops, you got me. It's all fake. But it doesn't matter. It's all about syntax. And then I'll just do that. OK, so what do I do now is this. And I can go even further and use the four dots, right? Order line. Like this. And it fits one line. But I'm still not happy because I'm opening a stream inside of another stream. And my brain dies when I do that, right? I'm in a stream, and then it's another stream. Come on. So what I do is I can extract this little bit. How I name such a method? It's like the order. This method will return true if an order has at least one order line which is not in stock. So has order line not in stock. You see? It's the same thing. And if I do that, and I have this little method here, I can do the following, which I do very often. You see the point? I'm referring the method in, my, in, my, in the same class. I can still use dependencies here. I can still use whatever I want. I've just simplified the thing. Then I can go further, and I can ex try to extract this bit. But if I try to extract it in the same way, I will get a method which takes two parameters. And this won't play nice with method references. You already get the point that I hate this symbol. Why? Because it means anonymous function implementation. And that's my problem, anonymous. You know, I want names to tell me what I do there. So I cannot extract them as it is, but I can do the following tr trick. I can create a, a local variable named, this is actually uh, has delivery date 
uh, before warning like this. And I get a predicate. So don't be afraid to work with, with functions stored in variables. That's one point. But I can do even more. I can extract this as a full-fledged method named just the like. So I will just extract all this as a method without any thinking. Eclipse will do the stuff. So I'm invoking a method. But this method need not be local here. I may need this function, this functionality in some other place. So why not make it a public static? And even maybe let's write another class. Why not? Order predicate, or even push it in the very order entity. However, this if you do that, this functionality becomes available to you in all sorts of places, wherever you need that, in other use cases. It's a parameterized, it's a function that returns another function, creepy stuff, higher order function. I agree, but it works if you really want to do stuff uh, all the way. And you can then compose them together. Why not if the change request comes, right? You can compose them together. Is confidential, something like that. You can imagine, you can compose predicates together. So a big part of, of working cleanly with Java 8, it's about where do you put the predicates? Do you put it in a method in the same class? It's super useful. If this, if this particular step is specific to my use case, to my class, I don't want to share it with everybody. I put a private method in the same class. Then I can push little bits of reusable stuff inside the entities. I can work with predicates as in local variables, and even I can create functions that return predicates. Right. So juggling with predicates, because filter is super interesting, super useful stuff in Java 8. Now, just some hints, random thoughts. Learn that stream API. Learn it all entirely. Group by, group by, flat map, monads, learn it all. Know it by heart. But don't use it all, to, all from the start. Uh, uh, deploy it progressively, progressively. Don't ever do that. Whenever you do that, extract a function and refer it with four dots. Why? To put it a name. To put a name. That's what you want. Named code. I'm talking about enterprise development, not your backyard pet project. Enterprise development, where we are working in teams, 10 people, we, who will maintain the code you don't know. So use optional dot map. Use it. It can get you rid of null pointer exception. It's super useful. Cherish your predicates like we've seen, distribute them in all the code, and find the simplest form. Because Java 8 is not Java anymore. It's a new language. You need some other pair of eyes there. So do peer review, continuous pair programming, actually. Pair programming is the way. It is the best thing you can do in your IT project. Now, hmm, key points. Stop refactor equals start legacy. Names, should, you should refine expressive names. Short methods. Classes can be structs, objects, or logic containers. Realize that. Admit that. Comments are failures. Always look for more expressive code instead. Pair programming is the way. Pair programming is the way. This should be the, the, the I mean, extreme programming, right? Pair programming. Do pair programming. Now, I think we're kind of out of time, but the point is, uh, the question that I always get is, uh, how do you apply this in my legacy code? It's super hard to apply all this. You should first practice. Do katas. Read about Emily Bach's coding kata book. Do exercises. Do coding dojo, hackathons, pair programming. Uh, practice the refactoring until you can refactor huge legacy code. Where can I read more? This is the New Testament, the new will, the new uh, Bible. Uh, literally, my developers are not allowed to write any line of code in my project until they've finished at least two-thirds of this book. This is like, like, I know, basic, super basic stuff. You need to know it all. That was it. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Any kind of questions you have, either now, either outside, how you prefer.